Hi everyone, thanks for joining our Avian Tech for Church first webinar. Today's topic is about enhancing the hybrid streaming worship experience. Before I carry on, please note that the audio and video controls on your end has been disabled. This is to help us ensure a smooth presentation. The only way to communicate with us will be through the Q&A function, which is on the right of your screen. This webinar will be divided into two parts for the presentation with a break in between, followed by a Q&A and polls. This webinar will not be possible without our sponsors. So we'd like to thank Analog Way, both professional and sure for their sponsorship. We would like to encourage you to visit the sponsors booth. You can access the booth on the left side of your screen. There are some great giveaways and special promotional prizes for you to take advantage of. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our presenter, Robert Su, who is the founder and principal consultant of Cogent Acoustics. Robert, how are you today? Great. I'm really excited about today. I just can't wait to get on the session. Robert, streaming is a hot topic, of course, uh, but perhaps it is not so much about streaming, but how to create the sensory experience at the home. Is that what we are really going to be uh, talking about today? Um, yes. The thing is, um, you know, we all know that the pandemic is um, kind of here to stay for a long while. And a lot of us are still working from home. Schools are going back to home-based learning. And of course, the churches are going back to virtual or hybrid worship. Um, the, the concern is that if this drags on for too long, right, people tend to have this disconnect and disengagement. Um, from their former places of worship. Absolutely. Right, yeah. So if we do this, you know, looking to the screen, just looking at tags and just a, a camera view, a simple camera view, you know, things are going to change for them, all right? And uh, so much so that they actually forget, you know, what is, what is church. We want to create something to make them engage truly across. Yeah, we, we want to bring that same environment, that same experience, you know, at home. So they don't feel as though they are far away from the church. Yeah, that's what it is. Thanks. So, without any further delay, let me invite you to sit back, take notes if you want to, and crank up the volume to hear Robert. Robert, all yours. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, today's topic is basically about enhancing the hybrid streaming worship experience. Now, that sounds like a very big topic. So, um, without delay, I'm just going to go straight in. As we all know, most churches today are already streaming their weekly worship services. And so this webinar focuses on best practices, right, to help worshippers at home better connect and engage in the online services. Now, due to time limitation, uh, today's session will basically cover a, a broad overview of the AV setup and operational requirements, all right? For the details, all right, as well as demonstrations of some of the various systems and practices, they will be presented in the follow-up webinars that we are playing, right? So do look out for them, right? They're coming. So let me just start. Uh, today's topics basically cover a few wide areas. One is we definitely want to identify some of the key oral and visual differences between attending an in-person service versus a stream worship service, right? So that's something that we want to identify. And then, then we're going to talk a little bit about how do you transit a typical church AV setup to a hybrid streaming system setup. Right, that is a question that is very common among uh, churches today, especially when we really, really need to go into the virtual or the hybrid um, streaming model. All right. And next is, um, then we talk a little bit about the science and art of managing sound and video. This may sound like a very simple topic, but actually it is not. So I'm excited to share about this part. And then we're going to go into how do you get a good immersive and engaging experience at the receiving end, right? So the first part of the session is going to talk about how do we get it right that we can stream it out. At the end of the day, how do the receivers, I mean, the people at home, how are they going to receive it and get the best results, right? So this whole thing covers from the front to the end, right? So this is uh, the main four topics I'm going to cover. But of course, uh, as you will follow me throughout the whole session, you will see that there's a, actually a lot of uh, stuff going on. So I'm going to go through the slides really quickly 
and I'll try to cover everything within a time frame, right? So um, this is going to be a quite a, a quick, exciting ride. So let me go into the basics of streaming, so which I call Streaming 101. Uh, in case some people are asking, we are talking about streaming so much these days, it's just exactly what is streaming. So streaming is basically the continuous transmission of audio or video files from a server to a client. In simpler terms, streaming is what happens when viewers watch a program on internet connected devices like our mobile phone, our tablets, or even our television sets today. So, but live streaming, is basically referring to online streaming media that is broadcasting in real time. So that's why it's called live streaming. So let's go to church streaming, right? What are the requirements? So let's talk about virtual hybrid worship model. Now, what is this virtual hybrid model we're talking about here? Um, for the past year, we've literally been having virtual worship services because of COVID-19. Uh, with hybrid, it, what it means is that part of the congregation can be in the church sanctuary itself. It can be a small team, small group, um, but the rest of the members will still have to be online, worshiping at home. So that's the kind of a hybrid model. So a little bit here, back in the sanctuary, and the rest are at home, all right? So as I said, many will still have to continue worshiping online. As we look at the situation today, in fact, in Singapore, we just reverted back to stricter uh, social distancing practices in churches. So. If this goes on, this can eventually lead to a disengage and disconnect, especially with um, hybrid and, and virtual services being here to stay for a long time, right? Thus, it is vital to help worshippers at home maintain that connection and engagement as much as possible. Otherwise, it ends up just as watching church from afar. Now, we cannot completely duplicate the experience in the century at home but we can do as much as we can for the time being. At least we are doing something. And we hope that with COVID-19, the situation gets better and people can go back to church. Now, that is the ultimate goal. That is my wish, if you ask me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, but for now, let's talk about this. So we, before we define the streaming setup needed to support our goals, um, let's first identify what are the key oral, which is what we hear, and visual experiential differences between attending a worship service online and in person. Okay, so this gets a little bit complicated, so try to follow me. So some key oral and visual experiential differences, I'm going to put it into a simple table so that we can kind of follow along. Let's look at um, worshipping at site, meaning in church. Now, it is very common. Worshippers will be sitting in the pews or the, the chairs everywhere, and they have a wide view of anywhere in the sanctuary, literally and they can experience the full ambience and energy of the century. The congregational singing, the clapping, you know, the vocal responses, you know, when, when the preacher cracks a joke, you know, people laugh and, and we can hear it and somehow, you know, we can just feel the energy in the room. And of course, with the room acoustics, we get a lot of reflection back from the walls, the, the ceiling and so forth. And that's what creates that ambience, you know, uh, that we get so much in the church. And we listen in so-called surround mode, right? We can hear anything around us. We can hear people laughing behind us, people on the left, people on the right. And in, if we get reflection from the ceiling, we, we can hear that too, you know? So that's the kind of sound that we are getting. So that's the, what we call surround mode, all right? And we experience the worship music mix in the right, proper balance and tone. Now, let me explain that a little bit more in the following slides. All right, now that we know what worshiping at sight feels like, let me try to draw a comparison with what worshiping online is like. Okay, so let's look at this. So this is worshiping online. Now, usually, what we see on our small little devices, whether it's a mobile phone, a tablet, or your laptop, or maybe even a television set, will be a view captured by a single video camera. And typically, if there's a congregation present, in the case of a hybrid worship service, usually they are not seen. The camera does not capture that part of the sanctuary, unless there are multiple cameras, but in most cases, it'll be a single camera. Now, this is true. We are usually also unable to hear the others on site, 
we can't hear the congregation singing, we can't hear the clapping, and if the preacher cracks a joke, you can't hear them laughing. You know, you, can't, you basically cannot feel the room at all. So that's a really, really different experience when you're worshiping on, uh, online. Most of the time, uh, unfortunately, what we hear online is kind of mono, right? It's not in the stereo or, or whatever. But well, that depends on how the sound crew mixes the sound when they're on site and how it gets streamed. And as a result, the worship music may sound a little bit unbalanced. Well, the unbalanced part comes from another portion which I'll emphasize in a little while. But it sounds a little bit dull, dry, and it feels a bit unnatural. And very often, it feels very isolated, as though you are just by yourself, or there's no one else in the room. This is a big difference. So what we want to talk about today is how do we bring the experience that we have on site, which I've highlighted in blue here, how do you kind of transport that? Kind of, you know, like, um, can you beam the experience to online? So what we're gonna do is to bring this into the online environment. Now that's the big challenge. So let's see how do we do that. Let's look at what's going on in the audio universe. One of the things that people tend to notice about worship online is they're asking, why is the sound so different when I'm listening online versus what you hear in person in church? Okay, so uh, as I described, you know, it sounds great and uh, you know, the full ambience, the energy and everything. But when you listen online, it's kind of strange. It's, it's a little bit different. Right? So most of the time, people are logging in, you know, and watching from their mobile devices. Let's say it's a laptop in this case. If you are listening through the laptop speakers, right? So that's, you know, that's not going to sound very exciting, right? It's not going to sound rich or full. Yeah, I know that some, um, some laptops, they boast of um, great speakers on board, right? I mean, yeah, I know. But it just doesn't feel the same. It just doesn't sound the same, all right? So you can't compare that with what you hear online. But another thing is, you know, uh, you, can, you can argue, say, well, why don't we not use these speakers on board? Let's say we use um, a great pair of headphones. So we, we plug in the headphones, whether it's Bluetooth or wired headphones, and then you listen to it and say, yeah, it sounds better now, but it's still different. So then you say, maybe, maybe people on site are listening to the big speakers, the front of house speakers. Then that's why you get a big sound. Well, let me tell you something. You can try connecting the same set of speakers to your laptop like this, all right? I mean, you can do that if you have the luxury of putting big speakers in your home and you connect your laptop to that same large speakers and you try to listen to the sound and you still find that it is different. It's nothing compared to being on site, right? So what's, what's really going on here? So let's dive deeper right, and see where the differences are and what's really causing this. Why doesn't the stream sound anything like the front of house sound? Now, in case some people are asking what is F-O-H, uh, it's not pronounced as full sound. Uh, it basically stands for front of house. So we learned something new today. The front of house actually hears a blend of tones and sounds from the house mix. Together with um, stage monitor spills, direct sounds from acoustic instruments like drums, um, or grand piano, and as well as reflected sounds from within the room. So that's what we're actually hearing. Now, if the stream is fed directly from the front of house mix, which is the front of house mixer, then you're only getting part of that experience, part of what you actually hear on site. That's the reason for the different sound mix in the stream. So let's look at it with a little illustration here. Now imagine this is the sanctuary you're worshipping in. So we have a stage, that's where all the, um, the worship team, the um, instruments are, and then at the back of the room, there'll be the front of the house mixer. And if it's just a very simple setup, the stream will be taken directly from the front of the house mix. What's really going on in this space? So let's assume there's a very simple setup. We've got um, the main loudspeakers, all right? So there's a pair here. Basically, this is what the congregation are listening to. That's what they think, right? But what's really going on is that there are also other loudspeakers on stage, you know, like the floor monitors, the uh, instrument amplifiers, like the bass amp, the keyboard amp, and so forth. And all those are producing loud sounds as well. And that's contributing to the sound that we hear on site. So this is what's really going on. Then we have the room reflections because sound is being projected into the room 
at very high levels. They're going to be bounced off the back wall, the side walls, and even the ceiling. And if, especially when the pews are not filled entirely because of hybrid worship or virtual, you get a lot of reflections coming back from the room. So we have reflections coming from everywhere. And if there's a congregation on site, you will also feel and hear the congregation. So can you imagine when you're on site, this is what you're listening to. But is it the same when you're back home online? So I've created this table so that maybe you can understand this better. On the left side, I've kind of put in the various you know, components of a worship service, right? That is the worship team, which should be comprised of the worship leader, the support vocals, keyboards, guitars, bass, drums, um, whatever. And so this is a very simple setup. And of course, there's the congregation. So these are the, the components that produces sound, whether it's a, a vocals or instruments. Then we have the sound mix that we hear on site. So imagine you're sitting in the congregation, you hear everything, this is what we hear. Now, this sound mix is actually a sum or a blend of all the various components that I've listed. So we have the direct sound, and you have the stage monitor amp spills, you have the room reflections, and of course, the front of house speakers. So what you hear on site is a sum of all this. So if I were to put all these components and try to put a value to it, like you know how much of it comprises of the direct sound and so forth. So this is a hypothetical example, right? This is just to illustrate what I'm trying to uh, say here. So imagine what we hear from all the worship leader, keyboards, electric guitar, and so forth is 100%, right? This is what we hear. Now, what contributes to that 100%? So you get 2% direct sound, 10% from the M spills, room reflections contribute 10%, and only 78% comes from the front house speakers. So the same goes for the support vocals, the keyboards, because they may be using keyboard amplifiers. So when you put a keyboard amplifier on stage, that's going to sound pretty loud. So you will hear that as well. And 10% comes from room reflection. So what actually comes up from the front of house is only 65%. So let me just move on to the rest. Same thing for electric guitar. Some electric guitarists I know, they can tend to play a little bit loud uh, depending on you know, what kind of music they're playing. So maybe it's a little bit higher than the keyboard. So I put a 35% here. Bass, wow, you know, I, I'm a bass player. I don't speak for every bass player there is, but I know there's a lot of bass players who like to play really loud, but it's not really their fault because sometimes it's a placement of the bass M and so forth. And it can sound really loud. So 40% could be coming from the bass amplifier itself. And 50% comes from the front of house speakers. So let me just go to the drums. Now the drums is a unique, uh, a unique situation here. Is if it's an acoustic drums, they don't really need uh, amplifier on stage. It's, it's loud by itself. So 45% could be a direct sound. And the rest, okay, there's, there's no amplifier spills. So room reflections, we still have 10% and 45% from the front of house speakers. And the congregation, obviously, they're not mic'd up, so to speak. You'll hear direct sound around 88%. That's my hypothetical uh, number. And 2% gets produced from the front of house speakers. What is, it, what is this 2%? Well, it could be picked up from the microphones on stage. It could be picking up the congregation. And then, yeah. So at the end of the day, the section that is highlighted in green here, now, this is what people at home expect to hear, the same balance, the same tone and so forth. Okay, but what they don't realize is that this portion that is, I've just highlighted in beige, this does not get sent to the stream because this portion is not captured on the front of house sound. So the front of house speakers, this so-called mix of balance is what gets sent on stream. So if you look at the percentage that's being sent across, you'll find that it is really, really unbalanced. You get a lot more vocals most of the time, you get less of the instruments, and you get a lot less on the drums. So this is the part that gets sent to the stream. If you compare the, the pink portion versus the green, you see there's this disparity, there's a, this great difference between what people hear on site and what they hear at home. So how do we fix this problem? How do we get a broadcast sound that is well balanced in volume and tone? Now, there are several ways of doing it. So let's um, look at it. One of them is by implementing a second audio mixer that's dedicated for broadcast sound mix. Now, imagine this is a typical century. Today, you have a stage and of course, uh, maybe you're working on an analog mixer. 
And uh, one of the things that I would encourage all churches to uh, implement as part of the streaming system is to put in audience mic or congregation mics. Now these mics are meant for picking up the sounds that are created by the congregation, whether it's singing, clapping, laughing, whatever it may be. Now these are the kind of energy that we want to capture. So we need microphones that are specifically meant for that purpose, right? So we have put in microphones for congregation and in a simple setup, whatever is being fed to the front of house mixer will get sent to stream. This is what we're getting most of the time. Now, the better way of doing it is to set up a second and dedicated audio mixer for managing the streaming mix and feed. Now this setup should also be in a separate room that is noise isolated from the sanctuary. So in the case, I'm illustrating here. So we have a broadcast room, right, that is insulated. It could be in another part of the building or it can be within uh, the same floor of the sanctuary, but at least it's, it's isolated. Now in this broadcast room, you will need another mixer. Now this mixer is meant solely for mixing what goes on stream. So what you need to pair with this uh, mixer, of course you need a, a studio monitors, right? And what I would like to use is also additional headphones as references. Now it is very important that we ensure that whatever we are using as studio monitors or headphones, they are accurate and good references. We do not want to be listening to a pair of headphones that you know, emphasizes on bass, you know, and then everything sounds so bassy, right? And at the end of the day, when you try to do the mix, you are kind of influenced by that extra enhanced bass, and what you get at home is completely different. So what you need is a accurate, neutral reference. It's also good that you kind of sound treat the room to remove or reduce as much of the sound reflections within the room as much as possible, because that is going to really mess up your sound mix. Treat the room acoustically, absorb the unwanted, the um, echoes, um, uh, standing ways within the room and so forth. And how we're going to set this up is we're going to connect the Sentry main mixer right to the broadcast room mixer. And then we switch the streaming feed from the front of house to the broadcast mixer. Now that is a proper way of doing it. Now this looks like a very simple setup but now what I've done is that I've emphasized the arrow here. Before this, I had this, this one thin line connecting from stage to analog mixer. And people think that, oh, there's only one cable, and that's not true. If you have many instruments and mics on stage, you might have like 24 lines or 32 lines coming from stage to mixer. So you have a lot of cables, which means they have to same, send the same number of cables to your broadcast mix, which is crazy in terms of infrastructure works, right? Yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of cabling. Now, a better way is, I would encourage, is to switch to a full digital mixer system because it's a lot more convenient in terms of infrastructure and there's a whole myriad of an availability of signal processors that are very, very essential for producing a good broadcast sound. So how do you uh, change that? So we have a digital mixer now for the main century and that, that line here is literally a single line. You know, it's a, it's a CAT6 cable or something. So a lot of cables cut down. And then we have another digital mixer for the broadcast. And to connect the two together, maybe we are working on a Dante or some other similar protocols. It's really, really simple. Now we just basically connect the two systems together, maybe via a network switch. And maybe and a switch can even send the same signals data to other third-party devices. So that's the really beautiful part about using a digital system. And now we just take the stream directly from the digital mixer. Okay? Now there's also a possibility that the broadcast mixer is not even in the same location as the church. Now in case you're wondering, can I, can I mix from my bedroom? You know, I don't have to come down to the church. That's actually possible right, with today's technology. Basically, uh, instead of being in the same room, you are in a remote location, wherever you may be. There are cases where it can even be overseas. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And you have a similar setup, okay? And you connect the on-site front of house mix system, right, via a VPN service. And from there, you can remotely do your mix for streaming. So here, right, instead of sending, sending the stream from the remote location, you can actually send the stream now from the actual site, but you control the mix from another location. So, but this is a rather complicated system and we will discuss the details in the follow-up session, right? Not for today. Now, you may be asking, what if I do not have the luxury of having a second audio mixer? 
or an isolated mixed room. This is probably faced by more than 95% of churches today, or maybe more. So you're not alone, whether it's because of budget or whether it's because of space constraint. Can we do it with just one mixer? Well, you can. Now, the end result may not be as great as working with a dedicated broadcast mixer, but it will suffice for the time being. In addition, certain conditions must first be in place in order to get at least decent results. So what are these? So let's quickly dive into that. Remember this slide that I showed you earlier, where the pink section is what we actually get on stream today, most of the time. What we want to do is to move the, the beige section, as much of it, back into the pink section so that we get as much of the mix, the balance and the components that get streamed to the home viewers or home worshippers. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to put this back into here. Now, how do we do that? Now, one of the things that you want to do is to keep the stage volume as low as possible. What is this stage volume we're talking about? It is the, the spills from the stage monitors, the instrument amps, and with the acoustic drums, you know, there's a lot of direct sound from there. We need to keep this part low. What do we do? We use in-ear monitoring or personal monitoring systems for singers and musicians as much as possible. That is something that I've been trying to implement in as many churches as possible. So imagine if you look at the stage setup like here, all this goes away. Firstly, you get a really nice clean stage, but that's not the point here. The point here is to get a clean sound. So you remove as much of the stage spill as much as possible. Now that's only dealing with instruments that are users, monitors, or uh, instrument amps. What about, you know, the drums? Right? The drums is where, you know, if you're using acoustic drums, then you've got to go with a full drum shield. Now, I just want to emphasize on the word full here because I've seen a lot of drum shields implemented where it's just the front, the sides, maybe the back, but the top is fully open. Now, if you want to implement a full drum shield, it's got to be with a cover, with a, with a top. So like this, you cover it. Okay, this is how you prevent spills from the drum set. Some people may be wondering, is the drummer going to die in there? You know? Well, there are ways all right, to uh, bring in air, bring in some ventilation, put in some cool air, and, and the drummer won't be in there for days, right? so it's just going to be like 20 minutes or 30 minutes, so it's fine. Or simply switch to electronic drums instead. Now, I know that whenever I bring up electronic drums, I can hear in my head thousands of drummers around the world says, what? You want me to switch to electronic drums? Well, I do understand where they're coming from. But today's technology with electronic drums, some of them are really, really good, and they sound great. And in cases like this, they are ideal for keeping the stage volume low. In fact, the drums become totally silent. You only hear it from the front of house speakers. Okay, the front of house speakers will also need to be tuned to translate better for broadcast sound. Uh, yes, the speakers can be tuned, right, to whatever need you have, whether it's for personal preference or the kind of music you're playing, but more so in this case, it's more towards what we need for broadcast sound. And a room acoustics, as I mentioned earlier, is a major influence as well. If you get too much reflections coming off, now it's going to really mess up your, your perception of what's really going out there, all right, because you're getting too much of these influences. And like, like this, you get tons of reflections coming away. So if you have a chance to treat your room better, to reduce the reflection, we bring the probably the reverb time to a second or less, that they'll be great. If not, if you're going to work with like a two second reverb time or more, that's going to really be bad for this purpose. So try to manage that part of the hall. And if you're using a single mixer, use a dedicated mix out or an auxiliary out. And you use that for streaming and you don't use the main front of house mix. So that way you have a main front of house mix sent out, and there is a separate dedicated stream mix out. So you have two, two sets. But let me just highlight that is this going to be ideal, right? Is this going to replace that second mixer option? No, because there will be limitations on this option. Your panning will be limited, your EQ available will be limited, Audio processing like compression, gates, and so forth will also be limited. You may not be able to use it or you may not be able to use as many as you like. So there will be limitations when you use just one mixer. So this is uh, how we deal with the audio uh, side with just one mixer. Now let's quickly look at, like, look at the visual needs. What do we have? 
Now, as I mentioned earlier, if you are logging in from home, most of the time you are watching a single view from single camera. And if you watch the whole service, say an hour or an hour and a half, with just one view, sometimes it can get a little bit tiring. I don't want to use the word boring because, you know, church service will be exciting, but with just one view, it can be quite tiring. And remember, the part about being disengaged from the rest of the congregation, now this doesn't allow you to see what's really going on. So let's look at this little graphic here. Imagine this is your typical sanctuary. You have one camera capturing from the back, so you see the, the stage or the pulpit, and maybe you can put another camera on the side, right? That gives a different view, a different option. So when you have that, you can see someone at the side. That gives a different perspective. And you can have another camera, right? Somewhere on stage or somewhere at the side. And this captures the congregation. Now this allows the person at home to see what's going on in the sanctuary itself. Now they know that, oh, they are not preaching to an the empty hall. So here they get to engage. I'll say, oh, I see my family there or my friends there and things like that. And that's where you maintain that connection. Well, of course, you can put more cameras if you want, but that's going to add cost. But if you want to add 10 cameras and your budget allows it and you think you need it, go ahead. But at least have two or three cameras. That will really, really help. And the other thing is, of course, in churches, we use uh, uh, our presentation slides for our sermons and our announcements. Now, of course, you can put that on screen, so you need a way to switch. And looking at the, a slide for too long, you know, kind of, you start to wonder who's actually speaking behind it. So you can actually have a picture in picture or a, a frame of someone speaking in set, right? So that they can tie the person talking to the slide. Or it could be the other way around. If the person needs to speak a little bit longer and the slides remain the same, and it's a fixed slide, then you can switch back to the camera view, but still put a slide in set. So that gives variation, and it's not just a fixed view. Given this option, please do not switch between views too often. Otherwise, it gets, you, know, you get seasick or something. Like for example, <laughs> you look at this, and then the next moment you look at that, and next moment you look at this, and then you switch back again, and you switch back, and then you switch back. Now you can do the switching, but please don't do it too quickly. Practice some discretion here, get feedback from the people, and say, is this too fast, too slow? So at least that way you get feel. All right, what feels right for the people. Provide a good video image quality, that's very, very important. Now, and I'm not asking for 4K video at this point in time, because it might be a burden on streaming resources. Uh, some people are already struggling with a full HD. So try to work on, ideally you'll be working on a 1080 or a full HD resolution, if the upload speed um, supports it. If not, if really you're struggling with the, the internet speeds and so forth, try not to go anything below 720. Uh, otherwise, it might look like this or worse. Another problem that I encounter with a lot of churches is that they've got different video equipment displays, the video sources like cameras and, and computers. Of course, right now we have the streaming encoders. They're all working on different resolutions, different aspect ratios. And then the churches get stuck. It says, why does my image look strange? You know, some is this shape and some is smaller and some are this and that. That's what happens when you upgrade system, you know, not in a single project time frame. They do it every now and then through the year or through the years. So one of the advice that I would give is you try to standardize all your uh, video um, aspect ratios, your, your video resolutions, so that whatever you get in the century is exactly what you get, you know, on the stream. That will really simplify things a lot for you. Now in the past year, churches literally dive into virtual and hybrid services. In the beginning, it could be as simple as using a mobile phone just to capture the service and stream, you know, whether it's uh, Facebook or YouTube, whatever it may be. But they realized that, okay, after a while, now, nah, you know what, this is not good enough. We need something better. So let's take a look at the streaming setup. But I think uh, before we move there, we need to take a short break, Thomas. Yes, Robert. Thanks for the presentation. I hope you found it interesting. We will take a short 10 minutes break for you to go to a washroom or refresh with a drink. Also, please do visit our sponsor's booth. Uh, as I mentioned to you earlier, there are special giveaways and promotional prizes for you to take advantage of. You can also use this time to send in your questions to Robert through the Q&A function, which is on the right side of the screen. See you in a bit.
Welcome back. Hope you had some time to refresh. And now we are on to a part two of our session. Before the break, I was saying we're going to go into uh, looking at what the AV streaming setup is like. So um, I've got a slide here prepared for you. Uh, it's going to be a very busy slide, so try to follow me here. So in, typically in a, in a church setting, there might be a worship team, and this could be an example of the kind of instruments being used. It could be a keyboard, it could be a guitar, a uh, cajon, and, and so forth. And of course, there will be microphones involved. Microphones for the singers, uh, or for the preacher, and so forth. We will definitely be using, let's say, for example, uh, stage monitoring or instrument amps in the beginning. That's very common. And all these will be connected to the main front of house mix, like this. And from the front of house mix, it goes into the front of house speakers. Uh, and I know this looks like a very simple setup, but this is just an example. And of course, for the visual side, we have at least a, uh, a laptop computer or desktop computer that will be handling the slides for presentation or the worship lyrics. And this will go into a projector, typically. So this represents a very simple, but typical church AV setup. Now let's put in the additional stuff, right? The additional equipment, devices needed to stream a service. What's new that needs to be added? So take it away. Now, of course, for streaming a service, you need to capture the video part. So you need cameras. So the camera can come in the form of a PDZ camera or a professional video cam, or a lot of people like to use DSLRs for video shooting. And all these things, since now there are more video sources now, you need some kind of a switcher or a video mixer. So you take that away, you put a video switcher mixer in between, and now all your video sources will be connected to this device. And that from that device, you will send it to wherever the target destinations are. In this case, we have a video projector. Okay, now let's talk about the streaming part. Well, the streaming part, most of us are using a computer as a streaming encoder. If you're gonna use a PC, a desktop or a laptop, you need a software for the streaming part. And a lot of people today are using uh, softwares like OBS Studio, which is great. Some people prefer other softwares like vMix, you know, as an example. But whatever it is, these are the kind of softwares that you need for the streaming part. So, but some people choose not to use a computer for the streaming. They prefer to use a standalone streaming encoder. And this is one example that's shown on the slide. So now, in order to project all the visual sources onto the streaming. You need to channel the video signal to the streaming PC from the video switcher. So in this case, you need to have a uh, device called video capture. Now video capture basically uh, converts a video signal that can be recognized for the PC or it can be streamed. So you need a video capture card. Now this video capture card was a very interesting thing over the first six months of the COVID situation. The whole world is literally trying to buy video capture cards. And I was trying to buy one and you know, a lot of them were out of stock because of that. But now, thankfully, everything has kind of stabilized so you can go grab a video capture card. And some would like to have a simpler setup. Instead of having a video switcher with an external video capture card, there are also devices out there that is like a two-in-one. You have a video switcher with a video capture function inside. So you do not need to use that external video capture card. So all your video sources, like your camera, your laptops, can be connected to the, uh, such a device. And this device can be connected straight to your streaming PC. So you can bypass that video capture. Then, if you want to get your congregation connected, you can also have Zoom sessions simultaneously so that people can actually see each other on Zoom. Now, I know uh, most of us are doing live streaming, which means the service is on, and it's streamed live, some churches may prefer to pre-record right, some of their sessions. So they will record it down and they will stream it on Sunday. So for that, you definitely need a recorder of some sort, which is shown here. So whatever that's coming out of the video switcher, you go to the video recorder first, and then when it's time to stream, this video recorder will be connected to the streaming PC. As usual, you need a video capture card most of the time. Now, if you're gonna do some sort of video editing, before you stream it. There are a lot of softwares available out there. Take a look at them, Google them, and you can find whatever needs, or rather whatever suits your needs, right? Okay, so that's the video part. So now I've got to connect my audio mixer to the streaming PC. So how do you do that? Most of the time you'll be taking an audio out, maybe it's the mix out, or a separate aux out, and that goes through a USB interface, because that converts a analog into a, a digital format that is recognized by the PC. 
So this USB interface will then be connected to the streaming PC. Right, so now you have the video component and the audio component. So then, with that, you can stream. So one of the things you need to add to this setup is this very important component called the congregation microphone. A congregation microphone can be in the form of a, a shotgun microphone, or if you don't have a shotgun microphone, you can use a, a unidirectional condenser, or even then, if you do not have that, you can use a vocal microphone. Anything, as long as you're able to capture the sounds, the energy from the congregation. That's very, very important. So that is connected to the front of house mix. And as I was advising earlier, if you're going to be using just one mixer for both front of house duty and streaming, all right, it would be good if you can keep your stage volume low. And one of the ways to keep that low is to make use of um, in-ear monitors and personal monitoring system with um, headphones or earphones for the musicians and singers. So that would be a good thing to have. Now, if you have that luxury all right, of having a second mixer, it would be fantastic. So you can actually connect the first mixer to the second very easily. And with this mixer, as I've shown you earlier, that you would need some sort of reference, right, like a studio monitor, studio headphones, and it would be fantastic if you can enclose this in an isolated space so that whatever you are listening on your studio reference, you're not being influenced by the sound that's coming from the front of house. So you want to listen and mix strictly based on what you're hearing from your reference monitors, because that's going to represent what people are going to be listening to at home. Absolutely. This second mixer will be connected to the streaming via the USB audio interface, similarly. Another way of managing this streaming mix, a lot of people like to use a digital audio workstation instead, which is possible. And this digital audio workstation will be connected to the main mixer most of the time. And instead of using a desktop standalone mixer, you can be mixing the sounds by a software instead, right, on your laptop. So depending on your need, your, your workflow, you know, your preference, uh, these are the options available. And then from there, of course, you need the internet service. You, you need a portal to the world, right? So you need an internet service, and from there, you can stream it to whatever platform you're using, whether it's YouTube Live, Facebook, or some of the more proprietary streaming platforms, okay? Now, one of the things that I would really like to advise uh, people to have is to have another computer or some sort of uh, a laptop or a monitor of some sort that you can check how your streaming is doing. Don't assume that whatever you're sending out is correct or good. It's always good to have something that you can monitor to see whether the pictures are going in correctly, uh, the sound is going in right, and so forth. This is uh, more or less a, um, a simple view of what is required for streaming. It looks very simple here, but bear in mind that in a real setup, there's going to be a lot more stuff than this. There's going to be a lot more microphones, a lot more speakers, a lot more video sources and so forth. Robert, would you also recommend that when you're doing the streaming, you have a dedicated landline instead of wireless? Yes, I'm going to go into that. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm right. definitely going into this. Yeah. So yeah, that, but that's a great question. Yeah, I'll get into it, right? What else are required? Hmm. This is yeah. it, right? It's the next slide, right? So what else are required? A lot of people do not talk about this. Right, we talk about audio, we talk about video, but nobody cares about lighting. Now, can you imagine this, this environment Absolutely. right now? We are being, yeah, I know, we are being videoed and there's no lights, right? Or there are very dim lights, it, it won't look as good as this, right? So good lighting is very, very important. Like for example, if you look at this picture here, yeah, you can see the person all right, in the video, but it's dark. You always see a, a man with a shadow on his face and so forth. Now, that's great for looking on for a few seconds, but to look at for a full hours or more, it's not going to look good, right? It's not going to feel good. Good lighting is very, very important yes. at the point of uh, video capture. So this is an example, and a lot of people are using just top lighting, which is not going to do your video uh, much good, right? It's going to cast a lot of shadows. Now, poorly illuminated subjects in videos cannot be totally corrected by software. Yes, you can but it will not be as good as if you have originally captured the video with good lighting. So you can see this really grainy video here. It's not going to look good, all right? Uh, a lot of softwares can't really correct that. Or maybe you try to brighten it up and things like that. You see what happens to the person, it gets burned. So it looks like there's huge light coming from heaven. Yeah. Right? Uh, that's not the case here, right? Yes. So, so it just looks strange, right? It's not good. So it's important to get good lighting. Does it need to be very elaborate lighting, right? You need colored lighting, you need moving lights and so forth. Okay, it's not necessary. Just for capturing good video, you just need good, bright, even illumination from all sides, you know, from the top and so forth, so that uh, you get very good uh, images captured. 
Let me just go back. So what else is required? So we have good lighting, this is very important. We need a good computer now. Right? So a good computer, you need something that is decent for streaming purpose. Now, of course, you need um, a computer of any sort, whether it's a PC or laptop, but a lot of people prefer a desktop PC. Much more important is that it must have the necessary processing power. The faster, the bigger, everything. Speed, graphics handling, and memory. That is very, very critical for your streaming requirements. Okay? Don't assume that something that you salvage from your, <laughs> from your you know, storeroom and says, hey, I found a laptop here, this should work for streaming. No, that's not gonna work, right? You need something decent that has got a processing power and memory because you do not want your viewers at home to get choppy video, you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and halfway you get this video hang you know, in, in the middle. So you don't want that. You want something that's uh, and stable, that's able to handle the kind of um, processing, yeah, processing yeah, yeah. video crunching. And if you're looking at running OBS Studios, there are some guidelines as to what's really required. Like in this case, you need at least an i5 2000 series processor. This is just an example. Of course, you can have an i7 or something. And then you need a proper graphics card and the amount of memory. So this is just a guideline. And very important, try to get a wired connection. Yep. Please avoid Wi-Fi. Now, Wi-Fi is great if you're watching YouTube videos for fun and things like that, you know, but if you're going to be streaming in a very important video that you need everybody to be watching at home, please rely on a dedicated hardwired connection. Yes. Please remove, you know, access devices from your network. Now, if your network is being uh, loaded with other things going on, now it's going to tax on your bandwidth, your speeds and so forth. So try to have a dedicated, which is what you're saying. Yeah. All right. And whatever program is running on your computer, please close it. Only run the streaming app program. That will ensure that all the resources on the, on the computer is reserved for the streaming purpose. Then yes, another question is the internet upload speeds, right? So how fast does it need to be? Well, let's take a look at it. There are a lot of guidelines on the internet. You can Google it, you can search for it. So I just put up a really, really fast slide here. Right? I know there's a lot of information here. You can just do a screen capture, whatever it may be. These are just some guidelines as to like, if you are trying to upload 720 or 1080p video at 30 frames or 60 frames, you know, what kind of upload speeds do you need? So this is just an example. Does it have to be so complicated and extensive for this streaming thing to work? Well, the answer is if you're looking for high quality results, then yes. But if let's say a little Compromise in quality is acceptable than a simpler setup would do, but sometimes you'll need a good un understanding of the AV system and a little bit of AV creativity. Now, what do you mean by that? So I've got a very um, interesting example here. Last year, I got a request from this Indonesian church. Um, they wanted to stream their Christmas service live. And, um, but what, they, what they've been getting is very poor audio for their previous services. So they seek my help. So I went down and take a look. In, yes, they have a very simple setup. They have one mixer, typically, right, in the main room where the congregation and the worship team is. And that handles both the front of house and the monitoring, right? So I told them, you cannot mix in that room for streaming, right? So I need a, a control room of some sort. So thankfully, there was a room just next to um, that uh, small sanctuary. And what you see, on the slide here is actually a view captured from within the control room. So this is the actual view through a glass window. This is an OBS screen, and this I'll talk about later. So what they have is one digital mixer, a simple DSLR and a camcorder we use for shooting video. So they have two cameras, which is great. And the mixer is located in the worship hall while an iPad was what I recommended to be used in the control room. Oh. So the iPad will remotely control the mixer. So even though the mixer is in the worship hall itself, I am in another room with an iPad. My monitoring, because that room is a very, very small room and I've got video guys just next to me and there's a lot of chatting and so forth, I cannot really put studio monitors. So what I had to do was I brought uh, three pairs of my own personal reference headphones, uh, three different types. They say, why do you have three, <laughs> three types, right? Um, I, I just wanted a, a different perspective, a different reference to see, you know, does it work on this headphone A and B and C as well? Because all of them sound different, right? So I wanted to be representative of what people are listening to at home. So I was using headphones to reference and I was doing my mix for streaming via an iPad, right? So what you see here is a view of the hall, 
All right, and this is the OBS screen, and that was the, the iPad. iPad. Yeah, I was mixing a service with an iPad, which is not something I like to do, right? Because I always prefer to mix on a, on a mixer itself. But in this case, that was the situation I was in, and without changing the entire setup, yes. without adding another mixer and so forth, this is what I did, right? And it worked wonderfully. Wow. Yeah, immediately people start calling in and say, wait a minute, what do you guys do differently this time? The, right? Yeah. You could share the difference. Yes, exactly, exactly. So a uh, quick drawing here to show what's really going on. So we have the sentry with the audio to the digital mixer, and in, and there's an audio stream that goes across into the control room through a USB interface and of course to a streaming PC with OBS. So this digital mixer was basically just handling the stage monitor feed. Because this is a very small room, what we did was we used portable speakers. What was the capacity? Yeah. Um, maybe about maximum 80 people. Oh. It's a very small room, yeah. Okay. So we were using portable speakers to function as both front of house and, <laughs> and monitoring. So it's two purpose. I took the main mix out for streaming. Hmm. So my iPad was here. So I was basically controlling the digital mixer uh, from my iPad using a Wi-Fi function because the mixer comes with this built-in Wi-Fi, right? And that worked. Wow. Yeah, simple. Look at this. It's nothing elaborate, nothing very expensive. You know, the iPad was owned by the church or one of the <laughs> members, and there was basically no change in the setup, but it worked because I isolated the streaming mix function into a separate room, yes. right, where I can monitor it, right, and make sure that I am streaming a correct balance and mix. Uh, if I'm in the main room, I won't be able to do that because I will be influenced by the front of house sound. Yes. All right, so this is a very, very simple setup. Yep. So of course I was using reference headphones, actually it's three pairs, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Now, now that we've covered the tech, so let's talk a little bit about the art part. Remember I mentioned is yes. both science and art. Now, the sound mixing for hybrid and streaming is quite a challenge. So let me just give you an example of a common order of uh, worship service online. Okay, typically, right, this is what I've gathered from watching a lot of online services from different churches. They will typically have a pre-service video clip, a music background, and most of them like to put a countdown clock so that people know when the service is going to start. So they are watching a video, countdown clock, and some background music. Then after that, when it starts, there will be a welcome message by either the pastor or someone on duty. And then the worship starts. And then uh, followed by some uh, announcements. It could be pre-recorded. So it's another video clip. And this is usually where the tithing, you know, the yes. giving by the members are going to take place. And there will be another video clip. Then comes the sermon. This is a very typical uh, order followed by the post-sermon worship and going to the end part, which is the post-service video clip. And again, there will be some music background. Now, this is what I have observed, right, from watching many, many online services. First part, sounds really good, right, because they are playing back a video clip. Very, very nice. Then comes the welcome message. Oh, suddenly the sound changed because it's no longer a recorded section. So the sound starts to dial a little bit, then the worship, oh man, this is where it you know, goes really, really wrong. You know, the, the levels were unbalanced, you know, there's a lot of vocals going on. Uh, remember I mentioned about that, you know, then the music was really, really dry. Um, then it, it's, well, it's not that exciting. Then comes the pre-recorded announcement, it sounds great again. And then there's someone, okay, just speech, it's, it's all right, it's okay. Then comes the post-summer worship, oh, back to the poor streaming mix again, right? And then comes down to the final video clip. Now, can you imagine when you look at this, right? If I were to plot a, a chart of some sort, the viewers at home, right? The congregation members who are worshiping online, they'll be going through this really roller coaster ride. Sometimes loud, sometimes soft, sometimes dull, sometimes clear, and things like that. It's really, really something that we want to look into and see how we can improve on this because it's really going to affect the people at home. Sound mixing for hybrid and uh, streaming is literally science and art. But let's talk about the science part. Huh? Now, it is very, very important that whoever is handling a stream right, must first be well-versed with all the standard mixing functions and techniques as the following you know, features will be heavily used in streaming mix. Right? You need to set the correct gain structure, the EQs, you know, the filters, the balance, panning, compression, gating, 
Uh, we use a lot of reverb delays and, and, and other effects. Now, these are all the uh, stuff that we need all the time to, and that gets into a nice, good stream. So you need to first know all this. And then we need to apply mixing techniques. Now, mixing techniques that are um, uh, inclined towards recording and broadcast, or it will translate better for streaming mix, because streaming is literally a broadcast. So the techniques apply here. So you really need to know, you know, what are the things to look out for? The tone, you know, how much bass and how clear does it need to be? How do you space out the various vocals and instruments, you know, and how do you create this sound staging? Now that is a recording broadcast technique. And of course, with streaming a live worship service, we have to now consider the audience congregation part. You need to know how to mix in now the sounds from the congregation, the singing, the clapping. In a typical recording project, you don't do, usually do that, but with a live event, right, you need to do that, especially for church service. And now they are even in, introducing immersive sound. Something new. Uh, search for it, right? I'm sure a lot of you have played with video games. You know, in video games, we have surround sound and so Absolutely. forth. You can feel yeah. people coming on your left, your right, you know, coming from the back and so forth. Um, they are now introducing immersive sound mix right, into programs. So look out for that. Now, if you can introduce that into your sound stream, that'll be fantastic because it really creates that, that atmosphere. Oh, but uh, wouldn't it also uh, matter on what you have on the other end when you're listening because you yes. don't have a surround sound? Yeah, yeah, we don't have that. Um, a lot of them make use of different techniques to create the psychoacoustic effect, right? It makes it feel like it's surround when you're just using a left and right channel, right? That really helps. But uh, if you were to do that, uh, it'd be better if you're using headphones. Of it, course, fantastic. Yeah. Or you're sitting r really up close to your speakers, which I'm not sure if you can do that. <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. Now, let's talk about video. Literally, you know, um, more than ever now, it, it involves video. Pre-COVID, I know a lot of churches do not use video cameras. They do not, right? Um, they they feel that they do not need to um, capture video, whether it's for online or for archives and so forth. Um, they, they do not need to have image magnification all right, uh, when they're running the service. But because of COVID, because of hybrid virtual services, everyone needs to be uh, camera uh, and ready, yes. right? So everybody went into video um, uh, stuff. Now, Operating video cameras, everybody thinks that they can op operate a video camera. Right? I can use my mobile phone and says I can do a video capture. But the thing is that they need skill. The art part, look at this. Now, uh, a lot of people are still capturing frame shots like this. Actually, it's, that's not right. It should be looking something like this, where the ratio of the person to the background and how much headroom you have and all these things makes a difference. Can you see the difference between what it was? Yes, not absolutely. And, this? Yes. And, and even, you know, um, angles like this. I still see videos being captured like that, right? Where it should be more comfortably shot like this. Simple things like that. Now, even dealing with uh, white balance, color temperature, that is something new to a lot of people, right? It can look like this or it can look like this, right? Depending on how you set it. So there's so many things, right? So they, they need to learn about uh, operating video camps. Softwares, wow. Now you need to have softwares that helps you to overlay backgrounds, lyrics, right, uh, like this, or you need to do video editing, especially if you are doing pre-recorded uh, worship service. And um, there was a time where they are not even allowed to have hybrid service or the musicians are not even allowed to be in church. Yes, in the you know, What they did was yeah. they recorded all their musicians at home, individually. They said, how do you spice them together and combine them into a one video clip that looks like this, you know, where you have multiple musicians in their homes, but somehow it just sounds like they are all playing together. In the same right? So this, all this needs skills, they need training. Right, managing, video, directing, mixing, wow, that's a, that's a lot of things. Uh, and it's very, very new to a lot of churches. In the past, it was just a laptop, I connect straight to a video projector and that's it. There's nothing to mix, nothing to choose, nothing to select. But here now I've got multiple cameras, maybe even multiple laptops, right, and so forth. Now I need to perform like a video director, when to switch to this, you know, which camera to look at what and so forth. Wow, it's a new thing. And managing lighting. In the past, nobody cares about lighting. Uh, as long as anybody can see anything, I can read my Bible, that's fine. 
right? That's what happened. That's why a lot of um, you know videos come in with black faces, dark faces, shadows everywhere and so forth. So now you know that good lighting is essential for capturing good video. So now you need to learn about lighting as well. Sounds complicated. That's because it is. I won't call it unfortunate, but you know, it's something that we move from one phase to another phase. We learn something along the way. We literally have to transform a simple church AV ministry right, into a production house. That's what we are doing. Like it or not, that's the fact. Okay? We all suddenly became production houses overnight because of COVID. Right? Now, with new requirements, there will be new processes, operations. And with these new processes, you need new skills. So where and how? Remember, we talk about trying to put this uh, experience of worshiping on site and try to port that over to the people worshiping online like this. I wish it was as simple as just moving this blue square across, but everything needs training. Now, a lot of us, we were not um, you know, using cameras in the past. We need not have to deal with lighting in the past or video softwares or even video mixing with hybrid or virtual services here to stay for at least a long while, I think. I wish it would end, but uh, for a long while, I think we really all need to get into that mode. Right? We need training in sound production. We need training in sound mixing. It's not as easy as just pushing faders. Video production, you know, videography, and even lighting. Lots of stuff going on. Well, I'm happy to say that uh, we're definitely going to introduce more webinars in the, in the future. Yep. All right? And we're going to focus on some of the details, like how do you do sound mix, how do you do a video mix and so forth, what are the equipment involved, what are the processes, the workflow, and even going to talk about lighting. So look out for those. All right? um, I wish I can say, you know, click here to subscribe <laughs> and, you know, and things like that. I don't think we're doing that here, right? Not yeah. So, moment, so no. do look out for it. All right? We are definitely going to launch more webinars in the future. Now, you were asking me earlier about what about the person at the end, you know, uh, depends on what you're using, right? Now, for this good, immersive, engaging experience, does it mean that if, let's say, we get the streaming set up right and we get a great sounding mix or a great looking visual presentation, does it automatically lead to a better oral and visual experience for the online worshiper? Does it mean that? Well, it should. But there's just one more thing to ensure the experience is complete, and that the online worshiper has a part to play in. So this is very, very important. Now, most of us may be using our mobile phones, our tablets, our laptops, right, to log in to watch the online service. And if you're still using our built-in speakers on the laptop, you know that's not going to sound great. So I'll really encourage, if you want to get a full experience, or a better experience at least, switch to headphones or earphones, whatever brand, you know, your preference, I think you'll still feel and sound better than using um, your built-in laptop speakers. Now, if you're going to use a pair of uh, speakers just beside your laptop, that's great. You can do that. Or you have a sound bar. Some people actually uh, get a sound bar for the laptops or the computers. It's fantastic. But, you know, one of the advantages of using headphones or earphones is that it not only gives you a better oral and more immersive experience, but one thing I learned is that it also helps to cut out noises from our surrounding. Can you imagine you're all now at home and your baby brother is screaming, you know, and there's a dog barking outside and, and things like that. Um, once you put on the headphones and earphones, you kind of cut out and you're more immersed into the service itself. So that really helps. That really, really helps. I mean, you need not need to do that, but it does help. Now, if you're going to use mobile phones or tablets, same thing. Uh, you can be um, using headphones or earphones instead. And nowadays, um, you know, with with families, you know, logging in together, it's kind of strange for them to kind of gather around a mobile phone or a, a laptop, right, to look at a small screen. So instead, they, they watch the, uh, and participate in the online service while watching on TV. So the TV is bigger, and a lot of them got great sound, in fact, which is fantastic. But if you want it even better, uh, like myself, all right, I've got a um, nice sound bar system, you know, even surround sound, but we don't have surround sound here yet. Or you can put a pair of speakers, whatever speakers you like, if it sounds a lot better than your built-in speakers on your TV, go for it. Now, if you are just one person, can I just watch TV? Yes, of course you can. And if you want even better sound, you can maybe have a pair of uh, Bluetooth headphones or earphones. And um, yeah, all this works. This at least 
helps you get a better sound experience rather than just listening through that small little tiny speakers on your laptop or your tablet or your mobile phone, right? So this, uh, I would encourage the uh, church members at home, when you log in to participate in the church service, try to use some of this, right? At least it gives you a better experience, right? Now for the visual, all right? Display size image resolution will have a great impact on the experience. Okay, if you're gonna be watching just on a mobile phone, I mean, that's, that's great. Now, if you want something you know, more exciting, more immersive, um, try to enlarge that screen size, or maybe you can move on to a tablet. If you want something even larger, you can move on to a, a laptop, okay? And you, you'll find that it, it really feels a lot better, looks a lot better compared to watching on a mobile phone. Now, even with a laptop, you say, now my screen, I've got a 15-inch screen here, so I want it bigger. Yeah, you can. Of course, you can always connect it to a, um, a desktop monitor, or if you want, I want big screen, you just connect it to your TV or even your projector. Anything that makes you happier, right? It makes you uh, feel like you know, it's, a, it's a better experience for you. Go for it, it does help, all right? So bigger, higher resolution does help. Now, I, I just wish that we can even go to the extent of, you know, <laughs> where we have virtual worship, right? Yep. Now, can you imagine we have virtual reality? I mean, that's just a term I coined up overnight, right? <laughs> yeah, can you imagine everybody is just donning, um, you know, virtual reality headsets and you really feel like you're, you're there. You're there, that's amazing. In fact, such technologies are really being used by corporates. Yes. Right, they're using it for their, or even education. Yep. Right? So once you don this and they've got some software designed for that, you feel as though you're in the midst of a lecture hall, or you're in a conference room talking to your colleagues. I've even seen it uh, uh, for real estate yeah, to showcase uh, your condominium or something before purchasing. Is exactly, right. That beats looking at a brochure Absolutely. or an online uh, 2D screen or something like that. So, well, um, whoever's watching this, if you've got something like that, uh, give me a call. <laughs> I'll, I'd love to know about it, right? And it'd be fantastic. So, I've come to the end of the presentation. I hope this has been helpful. Um, maybe we have some time for Q&A. Thank you, Robert, for this enlightening session. I hope you found it useful as well. It really takes science and art to create the experience. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function on the right side of your screen. We will not be able to answer all the questions due to the limited time, and so we seek your understanding on this. This is a recorded segment, and we'll be switching to live soon. Do give us a bit of time, and we'll come back to you.